Hey everybody, Ryan here. Welcome back to our pharmacology series. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on pharmacology with cardiovascular medications and how they influence the cardiovascular system. So let's talk a little bit about the human circulatory system, which is a closed system. So pressure within that system depends on three factors. The first is the pump or the heart. And this one is of course related to cardiac output, which is determined by a combination of the strength and the rate of the heartbeat. The second component is the tubing or the blood vessels. And the vascular resistance of the blood vessels depends on how dilated or constricted those vessels are. And the final component is the fluid or the blood. And this one is of course related to blood volume. The specific parameter is called stroke volume or SV. And that's the volume of blood pumped from the left ventricle every heartbeat. So the combination of the pump, tubing, and the fluid determines the pressure within this closed system. So there are two equations that define how these three factors contribute to blood pressure. BP, specifically mean arterial pressure, which is the average pressure in the arteries of the system, is equal to the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. And cardiac output specifically is equal to the stroke volume times the heart rate. So to put them together to get mean blood pressure in the system, it's stroke volume times heart rate times total peripheral resistance. And an increase in any of these values will cause an increase in blood pressure. And the same can be said if any of these are decreased, we'll get a decrease in mean blood pressure. So we'll re be referring back to these equations throughout the video. Now let's talk about some other important definitions. Systole refers to the pressure in the arteries when the heart contracts. Diastole is when the pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the heart relaxes. So when you take a blood pressure on a patient or yourself, if you get a value like 120 over 80, that's the systolic blood pressure over the diastolic blood pressure. So the pressure in the system when the heart's contracting and the pressure in the system when the heart's relaxing. And that's specifically in the arteries. Now we also have preload, which is the pressure in the ventricles before the heart contracts, and the afterload, which is the pressure in the arteries against which the ventricles must pump. So these are all some terms that are nice to know that are specifically in reference to the blood pressure. All right, so now let's talk about some medications. Antihypertensives are used to combat high blood pressure, and we have a couple different categories of antihypertensive drugs. So the first one we'll talk about are the diuretics. Now diuretics decrease resorption of sodium in the kidneys, so they essentially trap sodium in your urine. And because water follows sodium, more water is trapped in your urine as well. And this is why diuretics are sometimes called water pills. So a very basic understanding is that diuretics will make you pee more. And diuresis is just another fancy name for urination. So here's a snapshot of a nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney. And each of these diuretics accomplish basically the same goal but in different regions of the nephron. Furosemide is a loop or high ceiling diuretic that acts in the loop of Henle, hence the name loop diuretic. The hydrochlorothiazide is a thiazide diuretic, hence the name there, and that one acts in the distal tubule of the nephron. And lastly, we have spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. This one acts in the collecting duct at the end of the nephron. 
So diuretics can also affect blood potassium levels. Specifically, the thiazide diuretics can cause your potassium levels to drop too low, which is called hypokalemia. If you're on a potassium sparing diuretic, you can have that opposite issue and you have too much potassium in your blood. And this is called hyperkalemia. So both of these are potential issues and it can cause life-threatening problems with your heartbeat called arrhythmias, which I'll talk about later in the video. But it is important for the board exam to know that thiazide di diuretics can cause a decrease in blood potassium and may have to be, uh, you might have to take a potassium supplement to combat that and potassium sparing diuretics can have the opposite problem. Some more antihypertensives. These two drug categories have to do with the action potential, which is the change in electrical potential across the membrane of a nerve or muscle cell to allow the travel of an electrical impulse or signal through that cell. So these drugs essentially control ion flow to hyperpolarize the vascular smooth muscle cells and induce relaxation. So vasodilators like hydralazine open potassium channels, which is shown in the blue arrow here, to allow potassium to exit the cells, and this causes vasodilation. Whereas calcium channel blockers block calcium channels, which is shown by the red arrow here. And so this one is also causing vasodilation. So both of these cause the inside of the cell essentially to get more negative or hyperpolarize it. So in doing so, this allows those affected vascular smooth muscle cells to relax, which decreases peripheral resistance and thus, according to our equation, decreases blood pressure. Another thing to remember for calcium channel blockers is that they can cause drug-induced gingival enlargement or hyperplasia, and that appears on every board exam I can think of. So just remembering that calcium channel blockers have this potential side effect will only help you. And we have some more antihypertensives, and these ones have yet different mechanisms of action to attain the same goal of decreasing that blood pressure. So let's look at this first. These down arrows represent a normal process that takes place in the body known as the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So when the kidney senses a decreased blood pressure, it releases renin. Now renin converts inactive angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 in the liver. From here, angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, converts it from 1 to 2. And finally, angiotensin 2 will act at the angiotensin 2 receptors to induce vasoconstriction, which would bring that blood pressure back up. Because remember, this whole system is a homeostatic system that responds to a drop in blood pressure. So angiotensin 2, when it's active, is going to cause vasoconstriction, which is increasing that peripheral resistance. It's going to increase that blood pressure. It also induces the adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone, which promotes water retention, which also brings the blood pressure back up. Promoting water retention is basically the opposite of what the diuretics were doing before. But if we don't want blood pressure to go up, we can use medications to mess up this homeostatic system and reverse its effects. So we have a couple options here. A renin inhibitor would be like a beta-1 blocker, so that's an adrenergic antagonist like metaprolol, which we talked about a bunch in the last video on autonomic nervous system pharmacology. We could also use an ACE inhibitor, which would block step number two. The ACE inhibitors all end with pril, 
So lisinopril is a prime example of an ACE inhibitor. So this one's going to block the enzyme ACE that converts angiotensin 1 to 2, the latter of which is a potent vasoconstrictor, which we just talked about. And the final option is to block step 3. We actually competitive, competitively antagonize this receptor so angiotensin 2 can't bind to it effectively. So angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs for short, all end in sartan. So low sartan is an example of this. All right, so those are a couple of antihypertensives. Now we can talk about antianginals that are, that are made to combat angina, essentially for insufficient oxygen to cardiac muscle. And that's when you have uh, angina, which is that chest pain, and that's caused by insufficient oxygen to that cardiac muscle. So the classic emergency response to uh, angina, or more seriously, a heart attack, is this MONA acronym, morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. So N is the nitroglycerin, which we did talk about as those sublingual tablets used in medical emergencies. So nitroglycerin, how it works, is it provides vasodilation of smooth muscle in the coronary arteries to increase that oxygen supply to the cardiac muscle. We also could use something like propranolol. This is another beta blocker, and it reduces oxygen demand by relaxing the heart. And that's that function through that beta-1 adrenergic receptor. So there's a lot of overlap here between autonomic nervous system and also, as we'll see, among these cardiovascular drugs. Because now we see calcium channel blockers, which we use as an antihypertensive, can also be used as an antianginal. So these calcium channel blockers can reduce oxygen demand by reducing peripheral resistance by vasodilation. So same mechanism, but now it has two different functions. And this makes sense because it's all a closed system, so relaxing the heart and relaxing the blood vessels have similar effects. The only difference is that you're targeting the pump or you're targeting the tubing of the system. All right, our next potential cardiovascular disease or disorder is congestive heart failure, or CHF. So anti-congestive heart failure drugs are used for a failure of the heart to pump enough blood. So congestive heart failure is caused by a weakened heart, often one that has experienced a heart attack or MI before. So it's been through a lot and it needs some help. Cardiac glycosides work by increasing the strength of the contraction of the heart. And this is called inotropy, which we mentioned briefly in the autonomic nervous system video. Cardiac glycosides, how they work, is they block this NAK ATPase enzyme. And ultimately what that does is it increases the influx of calcium into the cardiac muscle cells to help it pump more effectively. So cardiac glycosides are helping the heart pump more effect effectively and giving it the boost it needs to provide blood to the rest of the body. Now here we go again with some more overlap. ACE inhibitors and even angiotensin II receptor blockers from just a few slides ago block angiotensin II in order to keep blood pressure low. And this limits the strain on the heart. So again, more evidence of this notable overlap among these cardiovascular drugs in terms of their application. All right, next we have antiarrhythmics. So arrhythmia means your heart rhythm is messed up, and these drugs essentially mess up your heart in exactly the opposite way. So if they're used incorrectly, they can actually cause arrhythmias of their own. So you have to be very careful about which one you prescribe and for which a regular heartbeat you're prescribing it for. So there are four types of antiarrhythmics. 
and they're all blocking something, either an ion channel or a beta adrenergic receptor. They're doing something with regards to blocking. So type 1 are going to be blocking sodium channels, but for cardiac muscle only. They're selective in that way. And type 2 drugs are beta blockers, some more overlap there. Type 3 are potassium channel blockers, and type 4 drugs are calcium channel blockers. Now there are a couple of memory tools you can use here. I remember that beta is the second letter in the Greek alphabet, so it's for type 2. The letter K has three lines, so I remember that for type 3. And CA2 plus is four letters, numbers, and symbols, so I remember that as being for type 4. But you can remember whatever memory tricks work for you. And here are the specific antiarrhythmics. So if you have any extra room for memorization, these can be really helpful to know or at least which of these specific antiarrhythmics can be used to treat atrial fibrillation, or AFib for short. So quinidine can be used for AFib, verapamil and digitalis can also be used for AFib. And then there's other ones here, supraventricular tachyarrhythmia. There are different specific types of arrhythmias that someone can have, and you can take measurements on someone's heartbeat to determine what kind of arrhythmia they're experiencing, and then prescribe the proper antiarrhythmic. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about cardiovascular pharmacology. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ian Zalau, David Jaden, Yannet, and all of my awesome patrons for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.